Hey Gengar gang, what is going on? My name is Ryan, this is the Analytic Gengar, and welcome to another video. In today's video, friends, we go over PSA grading standards for unopened packs. And today's video actually comes to us all the way from the humble land that is Instagram. So big shout out to Nick Sullivan. Nick, hope you're doing well, bro. And I hope you get a chance to watch this video. I apologize that it takes me 40 years plus a couple of months to, uh, you know, get this stuff done. But here I am, uh, you know, hope this video can help you answer all of your questions regarding uh, grading standards for unopened packs. And hopefully the same is true for everyone checking out today's video. Hope you all are doing well. And without further ado, let's get into today's video um, and talk about the grading standards for unopened packs. So two big notes that you have to take into mind when you're looking at the stuff. The first is what I'm showing on screen right now, which is the date on this particular article. So PSA pack grading is a really weird thing. If you go on their website and you start scrolling around, what you'll find is, you know, they make this, you know, big bold statement and look, we even made it onto the actual front page. The word Pokemon is actually there. They'll go ahead and they'll, you know, show you a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then, you know, there, there, there is a little bit of, you know, looking before you get to the actual um, grades. The th interesting thing is that this wasn't even here until quite a little while ago. So for the longest, you actually had to go out of your way to find grading standards for this stuff. And then just recently, it's been brought on to the actual um, website. And as you can see here, you actually have one page for grading standards that has all the different um, types of standards on it. So I guess it's good because they've definitely done a lot to kind of like, you know, help the website get better. Um, but yeah, so that's the first thing to note is that some of this stuff um, is going to be a little bit more aged. I don't know. And I did do a, like just a literal check on the differences between the two and there's no change. So interestingly enough, the article from August 7, 2006 and the one from here is almost identical plus or minus things like formatting and obviously the way that it's uh, tabulated on screen. The other major assumption um, or thing of note for the folks on watching today's video and trying to get a better understanding of pack grading is that these particular standards are always going to be written first and foremost for the most universal type of trading card. Um, and that includes sports cards, right? Don't forget that for the longest amount of time and for PSA's history or the good part of it, uh, sports cards were their bread and butter. That's how they made money. And so don't forget professional sports authenticators does a lot of sports card authentication. That's why you'll see a lot of the standards that we're gonna go over today um, were kind of written with sports with sports cards primarily in mind. And then they kind of like slowly moved into Pokemon. Obviously nowadays Pokemon has literally inundated PSA and many other grading companies. And so I do have a very strong feeling that in the future, we will see a lot more very specific Pokemon language, if not our own set of grading standards. But don't forget that, you know, for the majority of time that many people have been collecting, we've always been taking the more generic standards that are written primarily for sports cards and sort of shaping them and adapting them to our hobby as a result of the way that things are written. So do bear in mind, I will try to call those things out, but for the most part, you will also have to be cognizant of them as you sort of read and try to understand this stuff. Now, like any good YouTuber, I will proceed to read word for word all of the information that's clearly on screen and that you could very easily find if you go follow the link that I'll leave in the website for you and that's how we're gonna make content. I'm kidding, of course, and if you're not already a fan of the channel, get used to this dry ass humor because that's the only way we do things here. Uh, instead, what I have done is I've gone ahead and basically read the stuff top to bottom. And the idea behind that is twofold. One, I'll call out the big buzzwords for you as we're going down, starting from Gem Mint 10 and working our way down to, I believe it's Pour 1? Yeah, Pour Pour, Pour to Fear. Um, 
And the idea will be I'll call out sort of the big things and the big tickets along each of the different standards as well as calling out the patterns. And I think the patterns are more important than anything else because as you are trying to learn and understand and potentially submit cards to get graded at PSA and packs to get graded at PSA, it's going to be important to identify the patterns and then see how those patterns typically tend to grade. If you think about it, we already kind of do this with our cards. Whenever you're trying to grade a holographic, what are some of the things you look for? Whitening on the back, scratches on the hollow, right? Those are patterns that we use to identify whether a card is immediately not going to get a 10 or does it have a crease on it? Does that mean it's automatically going to get a six or lower? So those are the types of patterns that I'm going to try to call out in this particular video to also help you as well. So without further ado, let's get into it. Starting off with our Gem Mint PSA 10 packs. A couple of things. Um, PSA uses some very specific language here. It needs to be clean. So it obviously doesn't need to have boogers on it or glue on it from when you had this pack in your back pocket in school. It gives the appearance of being box fresh. And I think that's something really, really interesting to bear in mind, right? These packs will look as if you opened a booster box today and went ahead and started, you know, grading these packs. So that's an important distinction. Um, one of the other major things that they have here is that it will have um, superb or super eye appeal. Eye appeal is one of those things that PSA has always kind of hidden behind. It's kind of weird. Um, for any PSA 10 trading card that I've that I've ever submitted, I've always noted that PSA cards do allow a 10 to have a very very slight small imperfection, but the pack or the card still needs to show superb eye appeal. Basically, what does that mean? If you're holding this thing in your hand, even if it has a very small defect. It's a defect that is in a location or is in an area that doesn't take away from the overall looks of the card. When you're looking at it at first glance, it really, really does look gem mint, and that's the whole point. So for PSA 10s, whenever you're trying to submit packs, you want to make sure that they look or are box fresh, that they're very clean, and that you know, even if it's something that's coming directly from the factory, that it doesn't have any absurdly large or very ugly looking defects. For example, like when packs jostle around in a booster box and get crumpled at the top and bottom. Moving on to PSA 9s, PSA 9s are where we start introducing some wear, some slight soiling. So now these packs can get a little roughed up. Bear in mind, PSA 9s look exactly like 10s, but exhibit one flaw. So the idea is that whereas a 10 is perfect or near perfect, a 9 looks near perfect, but has that one little slight issue that's going to cost it. And so in this particular case, PSA makes note of a slight touch of wear, some minor toning, um, but it still has that overall fresh appearance minus this one little ding or imperfection. And note that as of right now, for PSA 9s, um, still no mildew or water damage. Um, mildew or water obviously can have weird effects on different um, types of packaging. So obviously they want to avoid any and all issues and PSA 9s would be free of that type of defect anyway. Uh, the one thing I will say with PSA 9s, they can almost always be identical to 10s, except when you're looking, there is that one imperfection that kind of costs it. So when you're thinking about it, think about 10s as the packs that come out of the box, box fresh, look exactly the day they did from the factory. A PSA 9 had a little bit more of a rough trip and therefore doesn't have that perfect box fresh appearance. PSA 8s are where mildew and water damage begin getting considered into the mix. So if your card has a little bit of mold, mildew, or water damage, here is where your card will immediately be placed. Now, PSA 8s will have many of the attributes of a PSA 9, and that'll be a pattern throughout, right? The grade lower will always look like the grade above plus one major defect or two major defects. From here, uh, a couple of things. In a PSA 8, you can have two corners of wear. You can even have a minor tear or a small stain. I think one of the major distinctions here is that you can have one or the other, but you can't have it all. So you can't have, you know, 
two corners of wear plus a minor tear plus a minor pinhole. You can get away with one of these things and still get an eight, but the minute you have more, your grade is going to get lower. Speaking of which, the lower grade is a PSA 7. So at a PSA 7, you're now allowed up to four corners of wear, a few pinhole size tears, a lot of, you know, little defects that kind of accumulate. The way I see it, most Pokemon card packs probably aren't going to um, approach this area, especially if they're box fresh. So if you're thinking about these guys or these girls on Instagram and Facebook and all these other places that are really kind of, you know, doing box breaks, weighing the heavy packs and selling or keeping those and then grading the light packs, for the most part, I can't imagine cards kind of trending about here. However, I think if you've had packs sort of out there in the wild for a little bit or they've been neglected, you might start seeing many of these different um, factors come into play, right? So things like the slight wear on the four corners, it's relatively possible if you're not caring for your packs. The thing with our packs, specific to this hobby, is the foil. And although it's not common on modern packs because they do a good job of printing all across the pack, in the past, like for base set, one of the things that's really tricky is that, you know, shiny strip of foil on the top and bottom of the card, um, on the pack rather. Believe it or not, that kind of works like holographic print. It can get scratched really easily. So unless it's box fresh, I do see a lot of wear accumulating on these corners and possibly bringing some of your more vintage packs that haven't been cared for into this near mint category. Moving on to a PSA 6. Here is where we're gonna start introducing surface imperfections to the mix. So up till now, we've had wear, we've had small tears, and we've had pin size holes um, on the corners. But now, at the PSA 6 level, we're also going to be talking about not only a variety of wear on all four corners, a variety of tearing on multiple corners, but in addition to that, we may have some wrinkles on the surface of the um, foil, we may have some other types of surface defects, uh, which means you might have something like a dent, a divot, a tear, a small, 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 small cut. Um, notice at this point that they're also really kind of stressing the idea that, hey, at this point we get it. Uh, there may be soiling or toning as a result of water and mildew damage, and that, you know, some of this stuff won't be considered so severe that's when you end up in that PSA 6 category. Now bear in mind, whenever they make mention of water and mildew, for the most part, I don't necessarily think it applies to us. I think it applies more towards sports cards, especially vintage sports cards, when they either had wax packs or they had paper packs. Those paper packs can get moldy if not stored properly over the years. And again, bear in mind, many of the baseball, football, basketball, and hockey trading cards are double, triple, quadruple the age of Pokemon cards. Pokemon cards in the grand scheme of things are only about 20 year, 25 years old as of this year. And on top of that, to my knowledge, every single major trading card set has been released in a foil pack. Foil, because of its very nature, will be water resistant, which means if it spills, you can wipe it off. I don't know how watertight they are. And the other thing is, is that even if they do get moldy, I'm pretty sure you can wipe them off um, and maintain them. And again, 25 years isn't as long, which means the chances of stuff getting moldy, all you know, albeit equal across the you know the the spectrum of hobbies, is probably less perverse in our hobby. And that's mainly because you know it's only up till recently that Pokemon cards have been cool, quote unquote, to collect to the masses. And because of that. Um, I don't really think there's many folks out there with mildew damaged cards. Could it happen? Probably. Will these standards probably apply to one specific situation? Sure. But I don't necessarily know how widespread it is as compared to other hobbies. For PSA 5, we have now entered the realm of clear tearing. And this is an important note. If your pack has any kind of tearing, obviously this means you should probably expect a PSA 5 or worse. Um, and so you'll have wear on all four corners, one or two clean tears along the edge or the corners. And the other thing that they introduce in this particular category is stains and discoloration. Again, because we have foil that these uh, packs are then printed onto, in the grand scheme of things, I don't expect us to have much discoloration. Um, the most 
frequent defect that we find in vintage Pokemon cards tends to be a um, print quality distinction. So you might find that some packs are darker than others and that's just because they used a heavier or fresher batch of ink than in previous runs. Um, but discoloration is rare among Pokemon card packs unless they've been left out in the sun and the sun has really done quite a good job of fading these cards. Again, as time goes on, I'm sure more and more sun faded packs may show up, um, you know, from storage, from, oh, my grandpa used to run a card shop and he left these in his storage or something like that. Um, but again, when you think about the way that we store trading cards, I think there's actually a pretty good chance that again for the history of the English TCG most stuff ships from the distributor in a cardboard box and those cardboard boxes do an excellent job of blocking out the Sun due to their opacity and so a problem we may see less and less of but definitely something to consider when you're submitting your packs as well at PSA 4 we're talking a severe tear so now we're talking where will almost always be present on all four corners um, you know holes and tears you'll have a severe tear that can really kind of you know really show something on the pack or you may even be able to see a few cards underneath the seal could be misaligned um, the surface will have discoloration staining soiling uh, possible damage due to mildew and water so yeah yeah it's a you know it's a pretty rough pack now here's the thing you might ask the question well Ryan at this point why are we even considering um, the cards that you know submitting packs of cards that are this rough well maybe not for our hobby but for other hobbies there are some really old trading card packs um, and so even if they're in this rough condition they're still you know historically significant if not very significant to the hobby and so um, you know while it may not apply to us because we're so young there are other hobbies that are far more mature where you know there might be hundred year old packs out there that will immediately grade a four but are still worth you know hundreds if not thousands of dollars uh, at PSA 3 we've got moderate tears along pretty much you know the entirety of the pack we've got heavy soiling we've got residue we've got um, heavy mildew damage that starts to bleed from the surface of the wrapper we're getting to that point now where you know the pack is more damaged and less legible than it should have been in any other prior format and at this point we've definitely lost that pack fresh look you can definitely tell that this pack has been through some stuff at a PSA 2 um, one key distinction here is that the pack um, now has degraded to the point that two things have happened heavy soiling and residue from foreign sources will hinder eye appeal substantially so at this point it's no longer looking like a good pack you probably don't even want to touch it because you're afraid of whatever residue or gunk is on the surface of this pack the other thing is that uh, the corners and edges of the contained cards may be exposed so that's an important thing to note is that you will start seeing sides of the cards exposed um, but the cards must still be held in the package by the pack and can't show any evidence of removal so that's an interesting thing that I noted there is that um, you do really have kind of you know they're very strict on that is that the pack could be exposing the cards but you can't have gone to the point where like you know it's just an open pack and you could have easily taken the cards in and out um, in theory some sort of seal still has to be maintained um, and finally but not least at a PSA 1 you've got severe additional damage you've got water damage you've got tearing you've got warping you've got discoloration um, at this point they also introduced the factor that you know wear and tear may be such that it distorts the entire wrapper the only thing they ask is that it remain legible enough for the experts to determine authenticity again I can't see a situation where any of our packs and our hobby go through this but there are probably some baseball packs out there that are so OG that they grade a PSA 1 and it's still probably only population 1 of 1 so just bear that in mind uh, in addition to this the pack itself may be severely damaged uh, but some portion of the original seal must be intact so again the minimum for grading a PSA pack will be the fact that some component of the seal is there and although you can see some of the cards um, and some of these cards may even have been damaged 
that the seal on the pack still exists. So with that said, friends, that takes us through basically the entire spectrum one through 10. Now I'm actually gonna flip it over to Table Ryan, who's going to walk you through my thoughts and opinions on one of PSA's new graded card slabs. Um, graded pack slabs rather. These were recently introduced um, and they've kind of been making a lot of noise in the hobby because a lot of people really like them. As I said earlier in this video, um, our presence in the hobby from the Pokemon hobby has been uh, definitely heard by PSA and so much of the various, you know, needs and demands of our specific packs and cards are now being reflected in some of PSA's products and offerings. And so I'll flip it over to the table where we'll take a look at one of these packs and really get a good understanding of um, some of the stuff that they're doing now that they haven't done in the past and how that's definitely benefiting us. Thanks, Overvoice Me. Alrighty, friends. So as promised, here is one of the newest slabs. Now, by the way, I am doing something new with the lighting. So if you do notice anything, uh, you know, weird, quirky, or if anyone is a lighting geek and wants to, um, you know, take a swing at some constructive feedback, you're definitely welcome to do so. But here is what one of the new PSA slabs looks like, and it is also graded a perfect gem mint 10. So this is EX Emerald. It's a really cool set, obviously very vintage, obviously very much in my niche. And um, here are some of my general thoughts on the slab starting from uh, the very top. Now, the first thing I'll say is that the profile of these has greatly improved. In the past, it had these weird feet sort of at the bottom. And what was really exceptionally strange about that is that it was basically meant to lay flat on the table like this. Now, that's exceptionally weird because most people would display their items like this sort of against a backdrop. So to think that there was a real life, you know, scenario where someone would be displaying it like that, and even more so that the PSA slab itself would be built to be displayed on a sort of horizontal surface was a little lost on me. So I'm really happy that the first change they made was making it more of a uh, flat surface in theory. That means you can still display it like this if you'd like, but more importantly, it now allows for collectors to also display their collections in an upright vertical fashion like this. The next thing that I will say is it begins to look a little bit more like a regular slab. So here's what a regular slab looks like just for comparison. And what you'll notice is that the aesthetic has very much sort of been brought up to speed. So this very much looks like PSA's most recent slabs. You can see these are from relatively the same generation. They both have cert numbers starting with four. And, um, you know, you get the idea that the new frosted edges and the new, you know, PSA logo, all that kind of stuff matches. So down here, you'll see a little ridge that's for the PSA logo. So, you know, this stuff really does begin to look a little bit more matching. And that's really nice because in theory, what that means is that there is additional added benefit to, um, you know, the way that your collection is going to kind of synchronize across the different eras. The other thing, uh, moving on to sort of a more in-depth look at this, is that I do love the very prominent sort of front-facing facade here, and obviously it looks really good, but it also serves a very functional purpose. This frosting, if this is ever tampered with, will actually crack and then will um, become very, very dull. So this frosting looks a type of way right now, but if we ever tried to crack into this thing, you would very clearly see that it had become uh, tampered with. So this is tamper evidence sealing, and it's one of PSA's main uh, sale points for using this type of frosted element on their um, cases is because they know fully well that by doing this, it's going to be very, very evident if someone ever tried to tamper with this stuff. Moving on, um, I do, you know, say one of PSA's strongest things is their label. Very simple, very easy to read, barcode, lithograph, and cert number and grade. So one thing I will say is that unlike CGC, which has a little bit more elementary type of, um, you know, 
label, I do really like this. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of space here if PSA ever decided to give subgrades, but I really don't think it necessary at this time. And then we'll just turn, turn this around on the back. Obviously, as you can see, the frosting remains cons consistent throughout the QR code in the back. And then you do have the holograph and the lithograph down there. Now, on to the main thing that everyone's sort of here for, and that is the card. So, as I stated before, this is a PSA 10, so obviously it's going to sort of meet the standards of that. As we look around the card, you'll notice that it's no longer being folded over. And I think that is one of the biggest and strongest selling points of this new update. Not only does it look good, but it's also incrementally more functional and more appropriate than what we had seen in the past because in the past even if this graded a 10 they would immediately go ahead and fold over these top lips and by doing that in a weird way you've created creases that you otherwise would have graded negatively against so in a weird way um it becomes a really strange type of scenario because um there's a you know pretty interesting change here where they've really kind of redesigned this now what i've noticed upon closer inspection is that this area up here and down here where my thumb and index finger are are looking to be kind of optional now in the past i had mentioned that psa cases were actually made for wax packs and wax packs were basically sealed in wax and that's why for other types of hobbies like pokemon what you notice is that once they introduce these and these have these sort of crimps on the top and bottom instead of wax seals they had to come up with a way of using the same exact case to address that issue so in the past what they would do is is they would fold the top and bottom over and fit these trading card packs into a standard wax packs fit but now they've created this new case and this is kind of a hybrid because in theory if you were grading a wax pack it still fits perfectly within this area there just wouldn't be anything up here or down here and then for packs like this or packs like Yu-Gi-Oh or really anything that's in a foil wrapper you now have the ability to let that extra flap hang out over here in the sort of free void area. It looks like, and I could be very wrong here, but there are some little circles uh, that you can kind of make out. So right there, you can kind of see it glistening right by my finger. And it looks like those may either be mounting points or if anything, some sort of uh, structural bit that kind of helps keep the pack in place and stops it from jiggling around. Again, another good point. But all in all, a great and large improvement over the previous era of slabs like i said it looks really good it's super clean and crisp it really shows off the full card um and i think by and far this is going to look a lot better on display as well as matching other psa slabs that you might have in your collection but other than that friends thanks again for checking out today's video i really do appreciate your time and as always I'm grateful that you could spend some time with me here on the channel. You could have been anywhere on the internet, but it means the world that you took some time to spend um, checking out one of my videos. Other than that, thank you again for uh, stopping by. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. And other than that, friends, thank you again, and I will see you soon. Peace.